Now we're, oh yeah, but the mic is working, right? Okay. I've referenced this book, so let me just say a couple things if you happen to want to use this. This is for readers of English, the, the Hebrew language. So if it was a Hebrew book, you'd start it opening in the, what we call the back. So if you get a Hebrew dictionary, it's going to, or the Hebrew Tanakh, it always starts in the back, right? Because it reads right to left. But for readers of English, we're going to open it the real way, the regular way. Kind of like driving on the right side of the road instead of like them Brits do. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so I just broke bread with him, though, so he can't hurt me, right? <laughs> so. But he kills people for a living. So here, anyway. So as you go through this, it's an interesting blend of Hebrew and English in that, okay, you start here and you have to know the alphabet sequence. So before we could talk about this, we had to run through the alphabet because otherwise you'd be completely lost. Now when I first got this book and when I first got the, the Stones edition, which is just the publisher of the Tanakh, I didn't read a word of Hebrew. I didn't even recognize the letters. That was back in 2004. So just so you know, this is not too hard for you. As I've tried to explain, this is your self. It's your innate humanity to be composed of these letters, as is the entire universe, as is the heart of Elohim, as is Mashiach, as is the Ruach, which is in you, right? So he's the one who's supposed to lead you into all the truth. So it's not that it's too hard for you. It's neither too hard for him. So don't, don't put up or impose that barrier that says, I'm too old, or I'm incapable, or I'm dyslexic, or I don't know how, or I don't, I don't have anybody that should teach me or lead it's innate. That's exactly right. You see, dyslexic is actually reading it Hebraically the right way. And so the dyslexic should have a, an advantage. Absolutely. They've still retained that natural order. So there's another interesting consideration. I mean, most people here have either lost their hair or it's turned gray or white or something here, or a little bit of both. But when you're young, you're being educated, then you got to get a job, and you got the family concerns, and you're trying to run your business and maintain some kind of stability. And for whatever reason, it's like, boy, once you get past 50, and especially past 60, all of a sudden things change. And so what I've noticed is that we now are at the perfect age for doing this, learning this, being able to put more time and, <clears throat> excuse me, more attention towards these matters without all the distractions because we also know other than that that stuff is necessary just to maintain some kind of life and make a living you know it's a responsible thing I'm not I'm not knocking that but suddenly we're kind of outside that arena and we're in a better position to do this than ever before so to think oh gee I've missed it I, I missed the bus and I should have done it years ago no as a matter of fact, now's the time. This is the perfect occasion because 10 years ago, you look on the internet, you could, my, my friend was looking on the internet, he could barely find a site or two. Jeff Benner hadn't even published hard copy of his book. He had an e-book e online, but Jeff Benner, by the way, is ancient Hebrew. I think it's dot, dot .com or dot .org. But um, he calls his ancient Hebrew and he has a different font of letters, but all the letters are still the same thing. I call this Paleo Hebrew because Paleo means old, but also in Hebrew, Paleo means wonderful, marvelous, this astounding mystery that's been hidden. Now, if you punch in ancient Hebrew, Paleo Hebrew, or the meaning of the Paleo he or Hebrew letters in general, Paleo in specific, there's all kind, there's hundreds of hours of information now that didn't never used to be. So this is quite an occasion of advantage. And then we were talking about the 2,730 year curse. I just barely mentioned it, not much in this particular occasion, but I believe that that would have, right or wrong, if it's right, it would have been over by 2010, which means since 2010, we're 
outside the, you might say, the envelope of that curse, as if there was a jail sentence. Does, does anybody not know what I'm talking about when I say that? Yes and no. Let me, let me explain a little bit. Okay, I, I, again, I'm trying to just give you a recap to bring us present tense, which is why I was going to talk about the dictionary. But if I lose somebody, then there's no point. It's, it's no value. So let me explain. You go to Leviticus 26. Four times. And remember, four is that dalit. Four is the door. This, the sacrum uh, triangle shape, as we were saying. Why would he say it four times? Is there some kind of a door? Remember, door isn't just the object, but it represents a choice. If somebody says, I'm presenting you an option. I suggest you choose life, but I'm giving you life or death. Or I'm presenting, I'm showing you the door. Do you want to stay in here and behave yourself? Or do you want to go outside? Leave this place. So Yahweh says four times, I've given you my ways. Now, if you guys want, one thing we can do, a couple times now I've noticed that uh, these words have been tossed about without specifying what they mean. But when Yahweh speaks of his matters, he mentions about five or six different classifications. Laws, statutes, ordinances, testimonies, and witnesses. There's five. What, maybe even instruction six. Are all those words the same or are they different? We've heard about the book of the law and the book of the covenant. Those look like two different things. Brit, the word covenant, is yet another thing. Just for what it's worth, Brit ish. In Hebrew, the word ish, spelled Aleph Yod Shin, means man. Brit is the word for covenant. So in Hebrew, Brit ish is man of the covenant. So gee, is that an accident or how did that happen? Or is it because the ones who settled there are giving it that name? I don't know where they say it came from, but I'm just showing you that Hebrews embedded in all these things. So is there different categories of things? One of the things that I mention is that you have this big white fence, right? Like the Mishkan fence. And just so you know, Andrew Hoy, last name Hoy, if you look at, I'm just giving them a plug here. I think it's called uh, Project uh, 314, as in 3.14, which is pi. Project 314, he's suggesting that the Mishkan was actually round with this dome cover and that we've completely inherited a mistaken design of the Mishkan. Now, whether or not that's true, that it was either a rectangular shape or a round shape, his studies and researching a different way to read the very same words and come up with this whole different pattern actually works. And it's very significant. And I, I can't tell you, was it really round? Was it really rectangular? You go look over in Shiloh in northern Israel where it stood and it looks like it was rectangular. I can't tell you. But he took the same words and figured out a round design which is a spectacular concept. And if you go look at that website, that I think it's called 3 or 314 Project, anyway, just for a reference. But for all, just to carry on, we're going with the uh, standard square model. Anyway, a fence is a chet. And then I mentioned that over the Ark of the Covenant that was inside here in the Kadosh Kodashim behind the veil was the pillar of fire, like a exclamation point, right? The pillar of fire above the Ark of the Covenant was maybe like this exclamation point, and then this billowing cloud of smoke is almost like this question mark. So sometimes I'll reference an exclamation point and a question mark as the kuf shape. Because that's, that's another way that I've tracked this model, right? Pillar of fire, pillar of smoke, over what? Over the Ark of the Covenant, which is to say, you got any questions? I told you, it's this stuff right here. And what was this stuff? The Kadosh Kodashim, the matters of the ten Debarim, Aaron's rod that budded, the manna, these are all picture types pointing to Yeshua being Hamashiach, and these are the instructions of the terms of the covenant. 
So if this pillar of smoke or pillar of fire and billowing smoke, if the smoke goes over the top, this almost looks like the lid over the box. Well, if you have a box, basically a trunk with this kind of a round dome kind of lid over, it almost looks like a treasure box, right? Mm -hmm. Those are the ones that, you know, you open them up and they've got kind of the domed lid, just your quintessential pirate treasure box. Okay, well, if, if this is kuf, and that's het, what word is spelled het kuf? Or sometimes there's a vav in there, but it's chok. It's the word translated law or commandment. So I choose then to look at this and say, well, everything between the letters het and kuf, as I mentioned yesterday, is everything, remember, Yeshua being put into the tomb het and ascending kuf. So what was in between? He was in the tomb, and then he arose. And it maps to the seven Moedim, which maps to the seven days. So there's something in there, which is the treasure box, which if we ignore the Moedim, we ignore the Sabbath day, we ignore Yeshua, we discredit the fact that he was ever put to death and put into the tomb, like the Yahudim. All those Jews who have a heart for the truth, they have a heart for Hashem, for Yahuwah, creator of heaven and earth. And they've been told, pay no attention to that scoundrel. His name has been made halal. Het lamed lamed, as we discussed, I think the first day, means profane, vile, common, pierced, wounded, disgusting, emptied out, dis to be scorned and put to death and kicked aside. That's what's been done to him. So they have had no benefit of the slightest regard because of what they've been taught. Just like the Christians have had no benefit of the slightest regard of the Moedim. But all this stuff, both, are in this treasure box. So the idea of going back and looking at who is this guy, Yahusha? What did he say? What did he mean? What about these Moedim, these festivals, inside this treasure box? We have to go back to the commandments because this is the word commandment, the law. And if we throw that aside and say, oh, no, that was nailed to the cross. And that's maybe a different matter than what Charlene was talking about, Book of the Law, Book of the Covenant. I'm not trying to address that, but I'm trying to show you Hebrew words. There's something about what he said in the treasure box. And so if we throw away what he said and ignore what he said, we miss all the treasure that's in the box because we think they're laws. For example, a couple of years I did a talk and... Uh, the word Deborim is actually not commandment. This is commandment. It should say ten chokim. <clears throat> Excuse me. But the word Deborim is matters or things or words. Ten words or ten matters. So I did a talk regarding the Ten Commandments and titled it The Ten Matter. The Ten Matters Matter. How do, how do they matter? Well, we read them as Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not kill. But as we noticed last night, picture of Moshe holding the tablets of stone, it said, lo, and then there was a three-letter word that was a verb. And probably a letter tav there, meaning future tense. So in English, we say, thou shalt not, but that's not what it says. The word lo, lamed aleph, means negative, or don't, or no. Now, if I say, don't do that, now, that sounds like I'm telling him, you better stop yourself from doing it. But if I said, in this room, there's no smoking. I'm saying, none of you better smoke in this room. Thou shalt not smoke in this room. Or I'm telling you, hey, if you want a breath of fresh air, then somebody outside where everybody's smoking can come in here because there's no smoking in here. There's a different way to read it. So what if you're always saying, tell you what, if you regard these 10 matters, and remember the word 10 means that which enriches or makes wealthy, then there's no killing in your world. You don't have to worry about somebody coming to kill you because he said, don't, don't fear. In fact, the most often repeated commandment is altira, which means do not fear. So if he says, well, don't be afraid, except you know, you're surrounded by murderers, you're surrounded by thieves, you're surrounded by adulterers and liars. But if he said, 
These, with these matters, if you're my people, there's no killing. There's no stealing. There's no adultery. Is he telling us that this is the hope that we have? Not just, it's a, you better not, but he's actually labeling what the wealth looks like. The wealth is, you can walk about without being afraid. That's a whole different way to take it. Yes. I've always in my head read, <clears throat> read the Ten Commandments. It's not don't. I've always read you won't. Is that acceptable in the Hebrew? Yes, because the, the word Lamed Aleph means the negative or to not exist, which is to say to nullify. So here's the interesting thing about Hebrew is that you might have one word and then it's all the other aspects of that word. We were just looking at a word earlier in the dictionary, not to get too far off track, but you realize that if you look at one word, it can mean the object, it can mean the verb, it can mean the, the one who is doing the verb, it can mean the idea of why you're doing the verb, and it can also mean the opposite of, for example, the word Pesach, well that means Passover. In the Hebrew, it is Passover, but it means to jump over something as if one was to jump over the threshold of, a, of the door. So for example, the, the angel of death or the jumped over their house. But it also means to be lame, which means you can't jump. So is Pesach meaning that you're so lame you can't jump because you're crippled or does it mean that it, to jump, it's both? Because it has to do with this concept of, of leaping. And so the more you look at Hebrew, now that's one particular word where it's this and the opposite. But if you look at the word Sair, Shinai and Resh, as another name for Esau, there, there's a dozen different meanings to that word and they look completely different. In which case, I would look at that and say, gosh, how do you know which one it is? And it's like, so what I try to do, just so you know, is I look at all of them and say, what if I can consider them all? And now I have to find, the, as it were, the lowest common denominator, right? So if you're doing fractions in mathematics, you have 1 over 2, 7 over 8, 14 over 12, 8 over 10, and say, now, what do they all have in common? Find the lowest common denominator. So it's one of the things you learn how to do in like fifth grade or something. So you multiply all the numerators, find the denominator and trying to reduce it down. And it's a math problem. That's kind of like what it is in Hebrew. That's what I'm finding is that if I find the common link between every one of these definitions, so I'm not paying attention to the vowel points because the vowel points will steer you towards one definition or another in particular. And the people who know Hebrew, who are grammatically correct, will tell you that I'm a bozo and completely off track by suggesting this to you. Because that's not the way you do Hebrew. By the way, Bet, Vav, Zion, Boz, and if you add a Vav at the end, so it's bozo, that means basically a fool. Just like Bozo the Clown, that, that's Hebrew. Bozo the Clown was Hebrew, just so you know. Yeah. Because inside here was everything he said, I'm suggesting that the pattern of what these two letters are in particular correlated to the Mishkan as a pattern that he he said this pattern was from heaven. He showed Moshe the pattern. I don't, want, I don't want to take away from you, but remind me. I'll talk about the word for pattern if you want. But I'm just saying, this all has to do with the covenant. Absolutely. In fact, all the letters have to do with the covenant. But go ahead. Low, Low means no. I'm, I'm missing what you said there. Okay, you're talking about the, the list of the Ten Commandments. Yes, now, in relation to, in relation to the rest of the covenant. However, what I'm saying here is that, and we have, we've got Goy, all right, as it means Goy, which, which is outside of the covenant. So, which is, there's the covenant people, and there's the Goy without, without covenant. So, the Goy have low of those. Yes. So the, the, the primary difference between the covenant people and the God people is that the God 
I would I would say yes. So essentially meaning that we all can have this view about genital or boy, but it is too abstract. Which which is to say that the contrasting um, the comparative understanding is boy means covenant Hebrews or the covenant and adult as against Hebrews or his rights in those who have Okay. Let me show you about this word goy. Does anybody not know the word goy? You don't know goy. Okay. Goy is a Hebrew word. I, maybe even you'd say that it's used in Yiddish or it's a, this basic word that the Jews. And again, when I say the Jews, I'm not meaning to disparage or to say anything bad or negative. I'm just trying to classify a culture, a mindset, perhaps a, a religion. There's at least a half a dozen different definitions about what Judah, Yehuda, or Jew means. And I'm not putting any of them down. I'm trying to say the people who use that word compared to those of us who have no idea what that word is. What, what's a goy? There's this phrase, goy boy. So if a Jewish girl has a goy boy, she has a Gentile boyfriend. And it's like, oh, well, that's just a classification. It's a little more than that. It's very negative. It's like... What are you hanging out with the pigs for? That's just, it's, they're scum. They're, they're ignorant, illiterate nothings. They're, they're profane. They're, they're halal. They're vile. That's what they say. Now, I'm not saying all of them say that, but that's really what's meant if you're Torah observant. Now, if you're not Torah observant and you just happen to be a cultural Jew and you happen to be hanging out with a goy boy, it's like, oh, that's, he's just one of those guys. It's like, well, okay. Because there's different um, intensities of regard, just like within the Christian realm. You know, you can be a carnal Christian or a devoted Christian, and you're going to live con two completely different lives. But just to say, I was wondering, well, what does this word goy really mean? So the benefit of the dictionary, you have to know the order. So let's look. I was going to look at a different word, but let's look at goy. So here's Aleph, and then you go through to Bet. And then because it's starting with English ways, when you read the Hebrew words, they're written right to left. But because this is for readers of English, we're going from left to right. So if I look, I have to know how to spell the word goy. So that's the benefit of having an interlinear or the uh, uh, Tanakh. You can look at the word. The, okay, here in modern Hebrew, the word goy is gimel, vav, yod. So in paleo, it would be gimel, vav, Yod, that's goy. Now, if you know the prefixes and suffixes, this yod at the end basically has to do with the word my. So this is the root word. Now, if you had a two-letter or three-letter word ending in a vav, the vav as a suffix basically means it or he or, basic, or, or his. So it, gimel is the driving force. And remember we said gimel was... A camel. The word gimel literally means camel. So the, the third letter, their phonetic G and our letter C is exactly the same. So camel and gimel. And a gimel has a hump. Right? A camel has a hump. The word gam, gom, gimel mem, basically means to pile or to heap. And when we say he went to the store. He even went to the lumber yard. That word, he even did this, which is to say, what's more, that's that word gimel mem. Well, why would that, if it's a pile or a heap, what does that have to do with even? It's because, what does the camel do? A camel goes back and forth like a truck on the highway. Remember we said that it's, it's shaped like a boomerang? You throw it out and it comes back, so it's this back and forth. So if somebody says, I want you to move this stack of firewood from here to there, you're going to go back and forth and pick one up and carry it over there, and the pile's going to get bigger. So the more often you go back and forth, the bigger the pile gets, like the camel's hump. So here's a picture of the camel's neck as the roadway. You put it in your mouth and it goes into the stomach. So there's this picture of carrying something, of transporting something, of getting bigger, the conduit, the roadway. All this stuff is, is gimel mem. It's also, I think it's a 1940s term. You look at some lady, you go, boy, she's got nice gams. 
you know, the, the round curve. So it's that hump, that, that's, that's also Hebrew. So I'm just saying, just for what it's worth, the more you start looking at Hebrew, it starts getting really, some might call it lewd, some might, it gets really earthy, very expressive. And the, the closer you look at Hebrew, it might uh, ruff, ruffle some feathers, but it's like, that's just what it is. So anyway, what I'm saying is that that letter Gimel has to do with going back and forth. So if we're going to look at, I'm, I happen to open this page and it's Gimel Ayin. So wait a minute, the, fin- the alphabetic sequence is that Gimel Vav, Vav is the sixth letter, Ayin is the sixteenth letter, so I've gone too far, so now I have to turn back. If I don't know the alphabet sequence, I can't use the dictionary. There's Gimel Lamed, I have to go farther. Oh, there's Gimel Bet, oh, I've gone too far back. Now I have to go the other way to find Gimel Vav. So I look up here at the top, there's Gimel Dalit, Gimel Vav Zion. I'm looking for Gimel Vav Yod. Zion is the seventh letter, Yod is the tenth, so I need to go further. I'm just trying to show you, if you don't know your way around the dictionary, you have to start there. Now, here it is on page 94, for what it's worth. Goy. It means nation, people, or Gentile, or an irreligious Jew. So if you're a Jew who doesn't observe the Torah, you're also a Goy. It says it's possibly... Now, this is etymological dictionary. It tells you where words come from. So that's why it mentions Ugaritic, Canaanite, Phoenician, Greek, Latin, Sumerian, all these other things. It's telling you related words. That's a whole other study that there's no time to go into, but I'm just letting you know. Gimel Vav Yod Yod means body, perhaps a back formation from Gimel Vav Yod Hey. So you have to know if you add the Hey suffix, what that does. A body? What does a body have to do with that? That's another, that's another story. Okay, that's as far as it goes. So you look in the dictionary and say, okay, that's what it means. Oh, wait a minute. Gimel Vav Yod Hey means body or corpse. But actually, Mem Tav means dead or body or corpse also. Gimel Vav Yod Hey is a Gentile woman. State of being a Gentile or heathenism. So here they're saying, if you're a Gentile, you're a heathen. So to say, oh, well, there's Christians that are Gentiles and then there's Jews. Oh, that's just a nice way of saying these guys have a different religion. It's like, no, they think of you as heathens, pagans, infidels, going to hell. (laughs) You have nothing to do with the covenant if you're a goy, by definition. Okay, that's as far as you go. It's like, no, wait a second. What I've found is that if you add different prefixes and suffixes, by you, this, I'm showing you a methodology of using the dictionary here. If you know the different prefixes and suffixes, here, if Aleph is in front of some other word, in the dictionary, if you open up to the first page of each letter, some of the letters, they'll show you the letter with a box. Remember, Hebrew is read right to left. What this means is that this can be any other letter or any other series of letters of a word. So this means Aleph is used as a prefix. If they show you a box with the Aleph over here, then that's Aleph being used as a suffix. So you can look through the dictionary, and even though it's exhaustive, it's comprehensive, it's not exhaustive. It's missing a few things. So I've had to try to piece things together through other sources of mostly looking in the Tanakh itself, but that's another story. What I'm telling you is though, some letters can be used as prefixes and others are not. But as a list, if you just want to write it down, here's the prefix letters. Aleph, Bet, Gimel, Dalit, He, Vav, Zion, Het, Tet, Yod, Kaf, Lamed, Mem, Nun, Samak, Ayin, Pe, Zadi, Kuf, Res, there's Sheen, and there's Tav. There, going through the alphabet, I'm just locating each letter. That's a list of all the prefix letters. There's quite a few. And they all mean something. So what I can do is now as a time of study, look in the dictionary under Aleph Gimel Yod, or Aleph Gimel Vav, Bet Gimel Vav, He Gimel Vav, Vav Gimel Vav. And then I can find, if those are simply prefixes, 
Sometimes you'll read that it's a word, and then I can say, well, what does that word mean? And then I can find the lowest common denominator again, saying, if I know what these letters mean as, as, a, as a letter, then if you take that meaning and you attach it to markab, right, a chariot, you attach it as a rider onto the root verb, it'll give you another sense of what's going on in the root verb that you might not see if you simply are looking up that word in the dictionary. And this is a perfect example. So I'm going to look at hey, gimel, vav. So the third letter is gimel. Hey is the fifth. So I'm, there's a dalit. Now I'm going to hey. Hey, gimel, bet. That's page 138. And, and hey, dalit is 139. So I know, oh, I'm looking. See, if I don't recognize the letters, I'm trying to show you if, you. if you at least know the alphabetic sequence, you can teach yourself how to recognize the letters. This is what I did. I didn't go to a Hebrew school. I did this. I didn't understand how to read this when I first got it. I just did this. I'm just showing you the, how to baby crawls, a simple thing. So if I come down here to Hey Gimel Hey, it's on page 138 and it's in the middle. But it starts over here at the bottom corner, just so you know. This is what Hey Gimel Hey means. Now, I'm looking at Hey Gimel Vav. Let me back up and go there first. There's no word spelled hey gimel vav. But there's a hey gimel vav yod. So I know that vav is just a suffix. Not just a suffix. But I know that vav is the masculine suffix. And that if I spelled a word gimel hey, that's the feminine suffix. It doesn't change the verb action necessarily if it's masculine or feminine. So therefore... Gimel Vav and Gimel Hey, kind of sort of the exact same word with, with some kind of connotation a little different. Now, so if I look at Vav Yod, see, Gimel Vav Yod, all I did, stick a Hey in front of it. Remember, Hey is the letter that means the. So if I was going to say the Goy, it would be spelled just like that. But if I look up in here, Hey Gimel Vav Yod means pronounced or thought of pronounced what does that got to do with a heathen or a gentile pronounced we're pronouncing words right but then i read a little further the same word means pronunciation with a different vowel point it goes from pronounce to pronunciation so the the text or the way the verb is put into action it changes with the dots and lines underneath the letters the same spelling of the word means steering. Okay, somebody tell me. Pick you. Why is steering and pronunciation the same exact spelling of the word? Uh, steering and pronunciation? So steering like steering a car and pronunciation. What's happening? What are you doing if you're pronouncing? What are you doing if you're steering? You're choosing directions about what? Where you're going. Now, let's see if there's anything else in here. Hey, Gimel Vav, Yod Yod is the word phonetic. What's the difference between phonetics and pronunciation? What, what do you have to say about that? What's phonetics compared to pronunciation? It's how you articulate. And how do you, if you're going to teach somebody phonics for English, say if a Chinese person comes in and they have a whole different way of pronouncing words, what would you teach them regarding the phonics of English pronunciation? How would you go about doing that? The vowels and consonants. Okay, but you can't teach them that without teaching them the alphabet, right? Because pronunciation is phonic, is the sounds that each letter makes. So my, my mother used to teach kindergartners, and she still teaches sometimes foreigners how to speak English. So you have to look at the alphabet in particular and say, this letter is pronounced ah, and that one is b. B. And this was 
ha. And this one is either wa or va. And this one is ya. Okay. Ka, la, ma. Phonics and pronunciation is simply how to navigate the steering of the alphabet. Right? So let's read a little further. If you add a vav nun, like in Zion or Shabbat Shabbaton, right? We talked about that the other day. You add a vav nun, and it basically means one who is in the act of doing it, right? So if you're in the act of steering, you're probably the driver of the car. This word means worthy, respectable, decent, proper, and suitable. Now, if you're going to be the driver of the car, you better not be drinking booze because you're not going to be this. And you better know the traffic laws because if you're driving on the wrong side of the road or on the curb, it's not this. So now, steering has something to do with phonetics, which has something to do with what is worthy, respectable, decent, proper, and suitable. What's that got to do with a goy? Well, they're heathens and infidels. Let's look a little further. Hey, Gimel, Vav, Tav. Now, I mentioned the other day that Vav, Tav, as well as Yod, Mem, are plural. But they also, this says it's thinking and meditation. So if I add a Vav, Tav after the Hey, Gimel, it suddenly goes from steering into thinking and meditation. And then if I look at uh, Hey, Gimel, Hey, because the Hey is the root word, it's the word that says rudder, helm, or steering wheel. Well, now a rudder or a helm is on a ship. You're turning the entire ship as a rudder or a helm. It also means rumbling of thunder. And it, you hear the thunder rolling across the plane. It's moving. It's like Tim was saying, if you're still, you're not, you're not steering. You're not, you have to be moving. So I'm trying to show you how do you pull all these themes into figuring out what is a goy. Moaning, moan, a sigh, whisper. What? It's not something static. It's something that's, it's these little things. Each little phonetic. Each little letter. The way you think, the way you meditate. Therefore, if you're thinking in Hebrew, hello, come on in. If you're thinking about the Hebrew letters, you're going to steer differently. And if you're thinking and pondering like thunder moves or like this moaning is not just, ouch, a moaning is, oh, it's this, it's this low undercurrent. Then rudder, helm, remember James says something about your tongue? is like the rudder of a ship. The entire ship is turned by the little rudder and your entire being by your tongue. And we think, oh, you better not say the wrong thing. This is saying the way we think, the way we meditate. Welcome. The way we ponder is going to steer the ship. It also, the same word, hey, gimel, hey, means to remove or drove away, or expelled, rejected, or removed. If you're drunk driving, they're going to remove your license, and you're going to remove yourself from the privilege or the right to drive. Hum, murmur, ponder, considered, muttering, meditated, and it also means he spelled a word. So exactly what I said is right on track. It's the spelling of words. So the goy spell words that lead them into heathen paganism away from the navigation of the Torah that you get from looking at Yahweh's authorized spelling of words. So who are the goyim? What is a goy? who's someone who can't steer straight because his rudder's broken and he doesn't even know it or doesn't even care. He has no way to navigate the course of Yashar Derek, the straight path. So his halakha, his walking, is like a drunkard 
stumbling and tipping over into his own vomit. I'm showing graphic pictures that I've pulled from other verses. So the Goy are not just Gentiles. In Hebrew, the Goy are those who have no ability to navigate because they can't think because they have no phonics, which is the spelling of words according to how the Torah was written, which is the Hebraic Aleph Bet, which is what Yahweh gave us to correct our path and get right back on the track. So you see what we just did? And that was just from looking at the word goy. By sticking one letter in front of it, meaning the. And if I took the time to put all these other letters in front of it, I could find more. And you could spend hours just simply investigating the word goy. Or any other word. Any other word. Which is to say, then the opposite is true. That if you're Hebrew or Torah observant, you do have proper steering. It is worthy, fit, suitable. You're not a goy. So if somebody says, oh, you're a Gentile believer, or you're a, uh, a, a, a Gentile, what, what the, there's a phrase of saying, oh, are you just one of the Gentiles that are doing Jewish stuff? It's like, no, I'm not a goy. I'm not a Gentile. If a Gentile is a goy, I'm no Gentile. Am I a Jew? No, I'm not a Jew. I regard the Torah. And we heard yesterday, I believe, I forget which verses, but Charlene was reading about Yahweh claiming to be the Elohim of the Hebrews. He calls himself the Elohim of the Hebrews. Abraham was called a Hebrew. Jonah, when they said, hey, who are you and what are you about? What God do you reference? And he says, I'm a Hebrew. I reference the creator of the heavens and the earth. Okay, there's a good classification. I can't think of a better way to call myself because that's what he, that's the term he uses. So I don't claim to be a, a Jew or a Christian. I, I have to call myself Hebrew because he's the God of the Hebrews. Okay, what does Hebrew mean? It means to be pregnant. It does, with the seed of the word. It also means to be angry because you've crossed over, you've lost it. Oh boy, he's lost it now. It means you've, you've gone from this place to that place, from this state of mind to that state of mind. That's what Hebrew means. The word Ford, like the automobile, means to cross over, to, to go over river. That's the word Hebrew. To ford is Yavir, which is Hebrew. Anyway, let me go on to another word, which is the point of where I was headed with this. We're going to look at one other word, which is, we're actually going to look at two words, because we're trying to get to Daniel chapter 2. <laughs> but, but what you didn't know is that if you don't know this, you'll never understand Daniel chapter 2. So this was all part of that. We're going to look at two words. One is spelled resh. That's modern Hebrew. Here. Resh, gimel, lamed. And the other word we're going to look at is aleph, bet, nun. Okay. Let's look at resh, gimel, lamed first here. So I know that resh is towards the back end, right? It's the third letter from the, from the tail end, 20th letter. So here I've got resh, pay because I recognize the letters. So I'm going to go look forward. Oh, there's a koof. I've gone too far. And I'm just trying to show you. you just got to go back and forth. This is what wears out the dictionary. Resh het. Resh vav. Resh dalit. So I'm saying, I'm showing you this, so you have to learn to recognize. This is modern Hebrew. It's not written in paleo. So you have to learn the modern, even if you don't want to. You have to do, learn the modern, So because that's where everything's written. Another project that I'm doing, the Shields Project, another thing, we'll talk about it later, I'm trying to make available, which is on my website, and I'll email it to everybody if you want, is things, verses, hundreds of verses written in paleo, so you can look at paleo, but anyway, Resh Gimel Lamed, Resh Gimel Mem, here's Resh Gimel Lamed, page 606, so I look on 605 to see, nope, that's Resh Gimel Yod, so okay, it starts right here, page 606, Resh Gimel Lamed, foot, Leg, base. This thing here, I could call it a resh gimelamid because it's the base of the easel, besides being the leg. But it also means foot meaning to measure. So a tape measure showing me an increment is also a regal. A measure in prosody. Does anybody know what that means? We'd have to have a dictionary. Let's not look at it. Now, regal also means time. Wait a minute. We said before 
that the word time was ayin tav. And we mentioned before that the something means that was measured is mem dalit, or perhaps mem yod dalit, something made, made to fit, like tailor made. So I'm just showing you some synonyms that it doesn't mention here. One of the things I want to do is get this card of Jerusalem to make another dictionary with some paleo things that was like a thesaurus where you have all these different synonyms. So I've been writing in my dictionary all these synonyms because the more you know, the easier it is to connect, make connections. Anyway, um, a festival of pilgrimage in the Bible used only of the three times, which is Pesach, Shavuot, and Sukkot. So this has to do with uh, Moedim. And remember, this word is both leg and foot and a measure. It's pronounced, this is the letter resh, which is R, and this is the G, and that's the L. And again, you're reading from right to left, so it's regal. And again, we're talking about Daniel 2. This is the legs and feet of the statue. Tell him I'm busy, would you? Thanks. It means to slander or clumniate. It means to go about as a slanderer or a gossip or a spy. So now it's giving you an action. It's not just the foot, but it's somebody who, hey, did you, did you know what they did? Hey, did, he's a big jerk. Let me tell you, it's the same word. So I'm saying it's, it's not just the foot, but it's the action and the one who is doing it and something that involves the foot, right? Went about as an explorer. Oh, so it's not that you're a big jerk. Hey, did you know that he's the regal? Now, if you didn't take it quite right, I'm talking against him. But on the other hand, this guy's been searching the scriptures like crazy. This guy's been going from here to there and investigating from this library and that church and this group and he's been searching out the truth. That makes him regal. So is regal good or bad? It's the action. It's, it's in Hebrew, it's not good or bad. It's, it's what the guy's, it, he's going around with his foot and he's, he's walking, they're trying to show you here, right? To be accustomed to or used to. Now it's a whole different thing. Meaning to go on foot or to go about frequently. If you frequently go from this room to that room and you wear a path, well, that's also regal. The camel on the highway going back and forth is regaling on this path. I've, I've seen that there's studies been done. Somebody built these buildings, an office compound, and they had put in walkways and nobody wants to walk in the walkway because they walk way out there and go walk way over there. And so they always cut the corners, right? And they keep wrecking the grass and they were spending thousands of dollars with the landscapers repairing the grass. And finally somebody had the idea, why don't we put the footpath where the people walk? So since somebody else had the idea for some other compound, they says, listen, we're going to open the buildings and we're not going to plant the grass yet. We're going to watch where people walk and then we're going to pay the guys to come in and put the sidewalks right where they walk. Good idea. Yeah. That's all regal. The concept of everything about that has to do with regal. Okay. He was made to do something frequently. He was led or guided. A path, a sidewalk leads and guides you. Trained, accustomed. Well, the word aleph means the trained animal. Also bet, trained and domesticated or become accustomed to the way of the house. So the, the word... The word Aleph, the word Bet, the word Derek, which is also Dalareshkov, which has to do with the way you walk, and the word Halakha, all are this regal. It's all the same word. They're all synonyms for the same action. Be made familiar with, you do it all the time, so it's the three festivals of the Moedim. Per slain which is that which, I think there's a car named that or something. Um, anyway, going on foot, walking, a footman, a footman, a soldier. Okay, Shiloh, what do you call the footman soldier in the infantry? Is there a name for that? How about regular? Regular 
Okay, it was my understanding, I'm just double checking with you, plus to wake you up, that, I <laughs> that the regular army is the infantry. Is that not so? The regular army? No? Oh, okay. All right, it, so I misunderstood it. But, or maybe the meaning has changed. Here's my point. If the, this is saying that the regular has something to do with the infantry, that's what this says. Walking. Because the word regular means that's your, that's your daily life. You're, you're a full-time guy. You don't have another job. You're doing it. That is your job, right? As, a, as a compared to the reserves. Okay. I remember seeing pictures of the regular army uniform was this and other, like in the Civil War, Revolutionary War, you know, different types of uniforms for different types of, of guys. I, I always thought that maybe regular meant they, that was the infantry as compared to the cavalry or something. Okay. So if you're a reserve, you wear one uniform. If you're full-time, another, a different type of regard maybe. Or maybe the names have changed over time. Okay, so change of meanings of words. That, that happens, so you can never think you got it because the, the meanings evolve. Um, where, where am I here? Soldier, infantry man, on foot, or a pawn. So you're playing chess, the pawn. The pawn is the one who moves one space at a time as composed to, compared to the bishop, the rook, the knight, right? Okay, where am I going with all this? In Daniel chapter 2, you have this statue. The head of gold, we were told, represents Babylon. The arms of silver represented Media Persia. The midsection of bronze represented Greece. The legs of iron represented Rome. And then you have feet of iron mixed with clay or pot shards, which is baked clay. To know what's really going on in a statue, I know there's been many books and many teachings. The SDAs, this is one of their favorite teachings. I'm not even going to touch any of that. I'm not going to com contradict or compromise anything that any of those guys have said, but I'm going to show you there's a whole different way to regard the statue. Now, if this was a, an exhaustive time, we'd look at each one of these words. What's the word head? What's the word gold? What is Babylon? Remember, Babylon is confusion. Head is where you think. What came out of Babylon? Well, there was silence, I mean, uh, uh, science, there was mathematics, there was, there was all these heady things, banking, all this stuff came out of Babylon. Media Persia, they were known for having horses, Parthians, Pars Parsi has to do with horses. They had this incredible cavalry, military, but arms has to do with scales of balance. I'm, I'm doing this, showing you that drawing that I had. You know, you put weights in here and as you weigh, as, as you measure, so it's measured back to you economics scales of balance is economics so you have military and economy something to do with media persia which took over babylon and then you have greek well alexander the greek macedonian came in and took over media persia and babylon and sat in their capital cities and he brought in what his culture his language arts and sports and education. Well, that's like the guts. This bronze. And you look at the word for bronze. You look at the word for silver. You look at the word for gold. That's, that's more of it. And then Rome came in. Alexander died. The four generals took over. Ptolemy and Seleucid and all. And then Rome came in and took over completely. Well, what did Rome bring in? Why is it these picture these two legs? Politics and religion. And later, out of Rome, came Islam and Christianity. What's this saying? They had taken over all this, but it didn't do away with the head of gold, the military economic, the culture of Greece. It amalgamated it. So is this statue just sequentially, one then the next and the next, or is it saying in the end you've got an extension of Rome? Because remember the word regal, which is both leg and foot, it's not that anybody took over Rome, but now you have Iron mixed with clay. What's that? It's morphed and diverged, kind of. But if you look at the United States Capitol building in the rotunda, if you look at the paintings inside, and there's a whole book written about this, 
they show the fathers of the American country at the time of the revolution and leaning over their shoulders, guiding them, giving them counsel is Greek and Roman deities. It's not Yahweh. It's Greek and Roman deities. And media Persian Babylonian ideas. America is the bastion of democracy. Back in the days when the revolutions were happening in Russia and in America and in France, the word democracy was a bad, bad word because it overthrew monarchies and monarchies were established by God. The Merovingian order, the royal family, the blue bloods, the Da Vinci Code people, right? So to them, the rule of the people is like, whoa, wait a minute. You can't kick out the kings. Why? You look at the chessboard. You got the king and queen. They're the biggest. They're the central power. And right next to them, the bishops. That's the church. And right next to them, the knights. That's the military. And right next to them, the castles. That's the judicial, the institutional, the medical, the educational system. And the, the bastion in front of them are pawns. Oh, those are the peasants. No, no, no. They're also shield bearers. Some of the pawns are holding the shields. The word esquire means shield bearers. Those are the lawyers. Those are the attorneys. Look at the chessboard. They'll tell you right there where they are, their power is. The feet, the ten toes lined up. It's an extension of the Roman system. It didn't annihilate the Roman system. So here this statue is exactly what we have today. And what is democracy anyway? The voice of the people? You got the individual people and then you've got they all vote and they come together to form a, an opinion and now we'll make that law which is republic. See democracy is the majority rules but then the republic is the rule of the law based on English law which is Roman law which goes back to boom, 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 right back up to this head of gold. This is an entire system we're looking at and in the days of those kings or what the days of what? The word king, melech, also means one who takes counsel. One who takes counsel. One who gathers opinion and then has to make a decision as a decree. That, that's kind of what the king does. So what do we have in the democratic system? You've got all the, all the peasants voting or thinking that they're voting. And then they vote for the elect, electoral college, basically, or senators or congressmen who supposedly are doing what they say. But they're making these other things. And they're making laws. And they're ruling. That becomes the... The authorized the, the king, as it were, of what goes on in the land. So it looks to me like we're living in those exact days, depending on how you read the picture of the vision. Remember, Nebuchadnezzar had this dream, but he woke up and didn't remember the dream. So he called in all his wise guys, his sorcerers, his Chaldeans, his prophets. And he said, if you guys are worth your salt, if you guys are really wise men, shaman, tell me the dream and what it means. And they're going like, whoo, nobody can do that. Tell us the dream, then we'll tell you what it means. Hey, come on, anybody, I, anybody can make up stories with a picture. I just made up a story with a picture, right? Constellations, make up stories. He says, no, no, no. If you're really who you say you are, you're going to tell me the dream and what it means. Or else you guys are going to start being killed. Well, they couldn't. So, that, so he started killing these guys because he knew they were fakes. And the word came to Daniel, who boy, Daniel, you're in big trouble now because you're one of those guys. And Daniel said, tell the king to stop for a minute. Now see, if Daniel had personal stuff at stake, he could have said, yeah, kill those guys. Yeah, darn right. I'll no, Daniel might have been killed too, but Daniel said, stop. There, there's an Elohim in the heavens, the creator of the heavens and the earth. Tell the king to stop. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask him because he knows Daniel got the, the idea. He was given the impression of both the dream and what it meant. So those rest of those shaman, counselors, Chaldeans weren't put to death. Another part of the story. But the point is, Daniel said, okay, you saw this whole thing. And he says, you, O king, are the head of gold. And after you will come another kingdom and so forth and so on. Well, cut to the end of the story. The king later thinks, hey, why should I just be the head? I'm the whole thing. So he makes a whole statue of gold instead of just him being the head. And he says, you have to bow down to that. And that's where Shadmach, Reshach, and Abednego didn't. And so he got thrown in the fiery furnace. It was kind of a response to this statue thing where he says, no, I'm not going to let somebody take over. But that's another story. Let's go back to this. Daniel says, at a certain time, 
a stone. This is the word eben. A B N. Read or pronounced as Evan. The B and the V is the same letter, so Eben, it's all the same thing. Eben. Eben Ha'azar, where we get the word Ebenezer, means stone or rock of help. So Eben is a stone or a rock. A an Eben hits the regal. Crumbles it. And the entire statue tips over because the statue is not a living thing. It's just an object composed of elements. The entire statue tips over, falls down, turns to dust. It pulverizes, turns to dust. The wind blows it across the face of the earth. And that statue is never rises again. But the stone turns into this mountain And it says it will not yield its sovereignty to another. So in other words, this now is a staging of kingdoms on the face of the earth. So the question is, as a riddle, which we'll investigate here, what event is the Eben hitting the Regal? I was taught that this Eben stone, which is cut out of the mountain, not with human hands, comes and flies at and hits the Regal, tips over the Regal statue, the statue whose feet and legs is the Regal, well, that's the coming back of Jesus Christ, the second coming. Now, you would never know that if you were in Daniel's era, unless you were given insight from the, the Ruach. But if you were a Jew, you'd never know that because that's a Christian teaching. And nowhere in Scripture does it say that that's the event. So if the SDAs or the JWs or the, it doesn't matter who comes up with another story. I'm just going to present to you another picture based on the spelling of words. That's all. So whether I'm right or wrong, you can take it for what it's worth. I'm just going to show you the spelling of words in Hebrew. Okay. So this stone hits the feet and it tips over. The statue disappears. That means the system, the order, the political, the religious, the politics and religion, the military and economics, the culture of Greece, the, the Babylonic, con- remember the word Babel means confusion, and it also is where the language came from. So all this Babylonic th- thing, it's removed forever. Well, that's got to be when the Messianic era is here. Because by definition, the removal of that system and the imposing or the placing of this other order is the Messianic era. So now we're talking about the proverbial thousand year reign. So from the Christian mind, it must come when Jesus comes back. But we're not talking Christian doctrine here. We're talking Hebrew words. So I'm not going to invoke that theory. I'm just trying to show you where it fits in. So what does the vision tell us? Well, a stone not cut with human hands. If you go back and you look at that phrase word by word, not cut with human hands can also be read not with armin with with human armed conflict what do you mean what how can it be cut out of the mountain not with human armed conflict it doesn't necessarily say cut out of the mountain it all depends you have to go back and write down the words as we did this morning we're looking at this other verse in Ezekiel 43 but you have to look at you have to write the words down in a pea paper and you have to sit there and look at like we looked at goy and it takes a half an hour to look at Goy. And it takes another hour to look at Regal. And you have to look at Eben. And you have to look at the words to be cut out with a human hand. And it, it seems to me that what it says is that this stone impacts the foot not with human armed conflict. You see, whether it's house white or white house, the semantics of where you place the words in the sentence, and as Charlene was pointing out, where you put the comma changes the whole meaning. And Edgar, you've found the same thing to be true. Where you, the, the spectacles by which you are reading the text influences your perception of what it means. If you have Christian glasses, you'll see it one way. You have Jewish glasses, you see it another way. If you're simply looking at what do these words mean, you'll see it another way. So who's to say what's the right way? I'm just trying to show you the way you can make the decision for yourself. Yes? No. I'm not suggesting that this is the thousand years. I'm saying that it maps or lines up with the concept of a thousand year reign. In my understanding of such a thing called the thousand year reign, 
seems like it might be appropriate to this vision. In that, nowhere in this vision does it say it's a thousand years reign, but look, if the, if the stone hits the feet and tips it over, where's heaven? We're still on earth. He's, he's shown a picture of the statue standing on earth, and these are earthly kingdoms. And now the stone hits the feet and the statue falls over. We're still on earth. The kingdoms vaporize and turn to dust and are blown across the face of the earth. We're still on the earth. Now this stone forms into a mountain. We're still on the earth. And it will not yield its sovereignty to another, meaning not another kingdom will come and usurp its domination, its dominion, and form another kingdom on the earth. This is the last kingdom on the earth. Now, if you listen to most Christian teachings that I've ever heard, multi-denominational, I'm just taking a bunch of them at large, I've been told, based on things that Yeshua said in Matthew 27, I think is, and based on interpretations of reading Revelation, I've been told that this beast kingdom, the new world order, the Antichrist, will dominate the world until Jesus comes back and that's the end of the world. Now, if this stone is Jesus returning, and it's still the world is going on, something's wrong. It, is it the end of the world or is it not? Is it in heaven or is it on earth? Is it a thousand year millennial reign in heaven while the devil's on earth kicking everybody around and ruining things? Or is there the last kingdom, the messianic kingdom on earth? Well, then where's the devil? Well, what about the second coming? Uh, did, did Jesus set up a an office in a high tower in Jerusalem with his computers and his cell phone and his laptop and calling the shots, looking out with his big view of these nice big windows, looking over the, where is he? The stone hits the regal, the entire statue falls over and the stone becomes a mountain. We're still on earth. Where's the heavens? Now I'm suggesting it's a thousand year reign because there's not another kingdom that can overwhelm it and it's still on earth and this little stone becomes a mountain solid base kind of a, like a pyramid shape of course the Illuminati is stolen the pyramid shape and says oh, oh that's us really I thought you were the statue head of gold arms of silver midsection bronze legs of iron and now they're claiming oh yeah but yeah but we're this mountain also yeah you guys are also liars so shut up you think too much of yourself What's this Eben? What's the Eben? Well, it's the stone. It's the Messiah. No, no, no. Wait a minute. What's Mashiach? Oh, gosh. In order to study Eben, we have to look at Mashiach now? Gosh. Okay. How do you spell Mashiach? I'm trying to find another color. Here, I'll use black. Mashiach is Mem, Shin, Yod, Chet. It's a different word than Moshiach, just so you know. Mashiach is the word translated Messiah, which means anointed, which it does. Read in the dictionary. But mem as a prefix means the instrument or the object or the place or the one who is doing whatever the verb action is. So the, the real word is shiach, shiach. This is a swimmer, one who swims. So the Messiah swims? He didn't swim, he walked on the water. How can he be the Messiah then if he walked on the water and didn't swim? Literally, this means one who swims. It's the place of swimming, so it's a, a, a deep trench. It's a swimming pool. What has the Messiah got to do with a swimming pool? These are real words. If you start looking, you're going to bump into this, and you might go, oi! You might go, ah! That's how frustrating Hebrew can get. But you'll also find that shiach means to communicate, gee, like pronunciation and steering and knowing how to hear, like wh what does this mean? What does this say? It's a communication. So mem is the object or the instrument of communication. But interestingly enough, if you look at the word spelled memshin, it's pronounced mush, M and S-H, mush. What does mush mean? Well, you have to feel it. If it feels mushy, if it feels mushy, what's this word? Mush is Hebrew. It means to touch or feel. To touch or feel the communication is Mashiach. The word made flesh. The communication 
in human flesh. The word basar is flesh, is gospel, is good news. To feel, to be able to touch the word, the communication of Elohim is Mashiach. What did that have to do with heaven? Lost my track. Yes. Okay. The, the next thing I'm going to do is talk about Eben, which is stone. So do you guys want to take a break? Sure. Okay. Oh, one more question. What, Bill? Oh. Moses going up and down the mountain and formed of these metals and same pictures. Do you see what he's saying? Yeah. Can you hear that? And then what came out after that? Okay, after he ground up the golden calf and made him drink it so it disappeared, never to be seen again, the reign of Elohim was in Israel, which is why they all turned in their gold and silver trinkets and said, whatever he says, we'll do. And they were quick to do it for a while. It's exactly a same fractal image, a fractal model, a prototype. The one is perfectly correlated to the other. Exactly what Bill said. Did, did you catch that? Okay. We'll take a break, but the reason why I brought in Mashiach is because we're talking about the thousand year reign of the Messiah, and I'm trying to say, we think the Messiah is Jesus coming back, but wait a minute, what is Mashiach? What is Messiah? The word in us. The what? The word in us. The word in us. The word, we're, we're swimming in his stuff. We're doing his stuff. We're actually engaged in the promises being fulfilled. In other words, if Yahweh says, I have a dream, I will be your Elohim and you will be my people. And boy, together we'll just like this mountain, fill the earth with his reign. They had to get rid of the golden calf first. They had to get rid of their heart to go astray first. And then he could set up his reign. So is the thousand year reign of Mashiach, Jesus sitting here at his office in Jerusalem with his laptop and computer and calling the shots? Or is it us doing what he said? Now, if it's us doing what he said, and we still have a thousand years in front of us, well, now suddenly everything's different. And we'll talk about that as soon as we come back with this word, Eben.